when I was um, being set to uh, deploy, or should I say when we were set to uh, invade, uh, at the last minute they gave me a pallet of humanitarian rations on my truck. Um, you've heard it in other testimony, a lot of people received such rations during the initial invasion. Clearly marked humanitarian. When we got over the border, um, as you've also heard, there was plenty of Iraqi children begging for food. I instantly, putting one and one together to make two, started handing out uh, the humanitarian rations. No sooner did I start handing out those rations than my first sergeant came up to me and in un no uncertain terms made it crystal clear that I was under direct orders not to throw out any more food to any more Iraqi children. Word was that General Mattis, commander of the 1st Marine Division, did not want to give the Iraqis the wrong impression about why we were there. To make a long story short, I got all the way to Baghdad. I got all the way back to Kuwait finally, and I still had this food on my truck. And I went to my command and I said, what am I to do with the humanitarian rations? And he said, bury it. And I did. I buried it in a garbage pit in Kuwait. I'd like to read an appeal from the, um, a response to my appeal uh, from the commanding officer, 1st Tank Battalion. Um, and this is about some allegations that I, I approached my chain of command with. Um, the colonel goes on to say that he, being myself, makes a number of comments addressing the leadership of the NCOs and officers of the Motor Transportation Platoon. I am concerned about the platoon's morale. I am awaiting the results of a recent command climate survey, and I have counseled the platoon commander and company commander on my expectations. Several indicators have surfaced that the platoon has immature NCO leadership and a lack of supervision by officers and staff NCOs. For example, NCOs have not been requiring Marines to stand at the position of attention while addressing them. This has been addressed. Additionally, the staff NCOs and officers have not been present at several platoon formations and PT formations. This has been addressed as well. Additionally, Marines have been conducting police call at 0530, which is the earliest time I expect Reveille to be sounded, and are not always being provided time to shave prior to PT or eat after PT. I am keeping a close eye on the platoon and its leaders. He states that there were sappy plates in warehouses during the war. These are our armored protection. Um, we had warehouses filled with them in California. I did not receive one uh, in Iraq. I have asked him for evidence of this. He has failed to produce it. He states that he had a broken gas mask in Iraq while equipment was available in garrison. I have asked him for evidence of this. He has failed to produce it. He states that he was threatened with a court-martial for feeding civilians. I told him he better learn how to follow orders. I have counseled PFC Howard on his First Amendment rights vis-a-vis -vis mutiny and fostering an atmosphere prejudicial to good order and discipline. He has been counseled on displaying anti-war propaganda in his barracks and literature critical of the president, including buttons, including buttons accusing the president. <laughs> including Buttons uh, accusing the president of being a war criminal. I've counseled him personally. <laughs> I've counseled him personally on allegations that he's attempting to recruit Marines from the battalion to join him in a conscientious objector movement. I have told him that if he wants to claim conscientious objection status, that he needs to stop voicing his criticisms of the war around Marines, but help is available to him through his chain of command. Finally, well, I'm over time, I apologize. Um, you know, the, just, the, the list goes on and on. Uh, back in the rear, being ordered to destroy parts. Uh, this was to happen frequently uh, in uh, our supply elements. I remember specifically uh, being ordered to, to destroy uh, Humvee exhaust pipe so we, we could order more. Um, it was brand new, and I had to take a sledgehammer to it. Um, uh, issues with reporters. How many times have you heard on the panels in the last couple of days how you cannot trust unembedded reporters because, or I'm sorry, embedded reporters. Because anytime you have a reporter on patrol with you, you will act differently. And for me, that just rang so true because 
we were briefed extensively on how to talk to reporters. We were constantly being told, if a reporter asks you how everything is, you just say good to go. And it doesn't matter what the actual situation that you're experiencing is, that you better say everything is okay. And, um, you know, quite frankly, there were, there were many Marines that they would not allow uh, to talk to reporters. Our chemical suits that we were given, um, keep in mind during the invasion, the weapons of mass destruction was a very real threat. We know now that it was um, a lie sold to the world, but during that time, that was an extremely real threat to the Marines invading Baghdad. We, 24 hours outside of the city of Baghdad, were ordered to take off our chemical suits. Nobody has provided me with an adequate explanation on the discrepancies in intelligence about why we're being briefed that there is a threat in Baghdad of weapons of mass destruction with the Republican Guard lying in wait, and yet 24 hours outside of the city we were told to remove our chemical suits. I fail to see the disconnect between the two. If we were told to remove our suits, then they must have known that there was no threat. Thank you. In closing, on a very personal note, I, I know this panel is, is called the breakdown of the military, and it's my position that this is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, <laughs> to me, it's, it's, this phenomenon that we're witnessing is actually a, a natural evolution, and any time you organize human beings to come together to use violence as a way of conflict resolution, you will have a breakdown of that organization. You know, you cannot both prepare for peace, or sorry, prepare for war and hope for peace. It does not work that way. You know, peace is not a political process, and it's certainly not a militaristic process. Um, to me, this war is just a symptom of something that's, that's much larger lurking in our society. Um, you know, and I really feel that that's the war within ourselves. Um, how we think, the language we use, the arguments we get in with friends and family. For me, what we see in Iraq is just merely an extension of that. It's merely a manifestation of the culture of violence that we cultivate here at home. The carnage in Iraq, to me, is just an extension of that anger. And it's, it's an issue that I, I struggle with personally on a daily basis. And I've committed myself to trying to work through this issue as openly and honestly as possible to try to wake up to both my own suffering and the suffering of all of my fellow human beings. So, you know, let's be brutally honest. The Democrats aren't going to end the occupation. <laughs> Our leaders aren't going to end the occupation. It's going to be us that ends the occupation. Thank you. Thank you uh, for that testimony.